likes to talk about, you know, we're so different than Vince. We've got all these great ideas. Boo boo government. Sorry, Silicon Valley started out of defense. I mean, whether it's the literal Moffett field and the uh, biggest employer in the Valley until the 90s is a defense prime is Lockheed Martin to, oh, the platform that you're all using that you're excited about, the internet came out of DARPA. So, you know, it let's let's take a, not just your five year experience since you were roommates with someone at Stanford or that you were, you know, partners with someone at Palantir. Sorry, there is this longer history to it. But what we're getting at is there's this been recent wave, not just of Silicon Valley coming back to defense, but venture back capital coming into defense. And that's where, you know, depending on how you've cut it, somewhere between 120 to roughly 220 billion dollars worth of venture back capital moving in the defense sector. And uh, that is yielding, there's a lot of new companies offering a, a wide variety of potential services and products, whether it's cybersecurity to AI operations to small drones. But the challenge set is going to be twofold. One, how does in the, not just in a, a six month period, a one year period, but how do we think about risk in a, so venture back capital thinks about risk in a very different way. It's very um, risk seeking, high risk, high reward. And, uh, you know, uh, fake it till you make it. And, you know, I can give you all the sort of, you know, like disrupt. And I mean, there's a whole, like, and that's the value set of it. And let me be very clear. Like, you know, I'm on the advisory board for some of these companies. I'm excited by them. They bring a lot of innovation, but there is a, seeking, uh, you know, it's high levels of risk. And the concern is how much of that risk gets actually put on the war fighter at the end. If the company doesn't deliver, it's one thing if it's an app that fails. It's another thing if people die out of it. But then there's another part of venture back capital that comes with kind of the risk seeking is that at a certain point, the companies or rather the people behind them want to exit. They want to make, they put the money in to make more money and they exit either through mergers, bigger company buys them, you know, Instagram, gets bought by Facebook, etc., or through IPOs, we go public. That is going to be a more challenging story in the defense sector because the the primes of Silicon Valley that had done most of the mergers and buying, the you know your goal was to be bought by Google or Meta. There's really only a handful. Are they going to be excited to buy up the startups in the defense sector? Well, I'm, Less so. I'm assuming the defense primes will. Right, the Lockheeds of the world. Oh, oh but let's let's talk further about that. What about if the defense prime, the valuation of the company that it wants to, is it is it uh, you know let's look at a company like Boeing, a defense prime right now. Is it Boeing by someone else or someone buys Boeing? You get what I'm saying? Like the the valuation has to be really high, but the primes, the defense primes, going to be challenging for them to buy enough of them to drive it. It's a challenge set. The other is to go public, but the public part, not everyone can. But also at that point, you've got to reveal your profit margins. So the average profit margin of a publicly held defense company. Company, it's around like 11%. The average profit margin of a tech publicly held tech company, generic tech company, not a really snazzy one, is around 30%. When a, def a new gen defense company goes public, on one hand, the owners of it are going to want like an amazing profit margin, right? That's the you know high growth, high profit. Like that's why we went into it. But now, hold it. Taxpayers are paying for it. Congress gets insight to it. So it's I mean, an Palantir awesome is one, new. Palantir is one example of one of these, uh, you know, newer, defense, new age defense tech firms that has gone public. Just give me, you know, what, how do we handle a situation when a new age defense company goes public and it has a 60% profit margin? Awesome news for that company. Twice the level of profits that a regular uh, tech company is generating. Six times the level of profits that a regular defense company is generating. Awesome for them. What's Congress going to say? What's the taxpayer going to say? Oh, we want to pay. You get what I'm getting. It's no. not an. It's not as easy a story as people have been talking about it recently. No, of course the other option here is that you know the one. I mean, you know, it could be Mr. Lockheed meeting Mr. Martin, becoming Lockheed Martin. Instead of one buying the other, you might see more mergers. Uh, I think to your point. Uh, 
The second is, of course, you have very, very large companies today in the form of your big tech firms that are worth trillions of dollars on their own, where they start to basically have these as their defense tech arms, right? So they buy them. They still have the kind of extraordinary margins that, you know, sometimes you're talking about. NVIDIA, you know, we've seen their meteoric rise over the last two, three, four years. And then they buy them and somehow the merged profit margins are are, are, are unclear uh, to the public eye. And, and, and therefore this away. It, again, that's that's the hope for the companies is that, yeah. and you know, you hit it exactly right there. If you go back and actually on the, the walls of like uh, Lockheed Martin's headquarters, there's a, a series of, uh, it's like the corporate history and it's got a lines, you know, and it dates back to the 1920s and it's this company combines with this company, this company, this company, and then, you know, and, they, and you hit Lockheed and Martin come together and it's an, it's an amazing story. But what we're getting at is, you know, is that going to be part of the story for every defense tech company? Or as you put it, maybe Maybe it's instead they're absorbing part of the primes, but where you hit that kind of coming together, I, I think of the story of um, a company like iRobot, you know, which made the Rumba, but it also was making military robotics years back. The military robotics division was selling well. There were uh, pack bots being used in Iraq and Afghanistan, but it did not have, at least at the time, the potential growth that a tech company is looking. It had a, a nice defense company look, but the, the, the government division did not have the that arcing upwards that we're looking for and to keep share prices going. And notice that iRobot, uh, you know, I've got a Roomba. I'm a fan of of them, but you don't see thousands and thousands of packbots or packbot drones, even though it was a company right at the at the start, at the center of this. So even that idea of maybe we can bring it all together into one, you still have divisions. And again, publicly held company, people look at the different divisions and say, which one is performing? Which one's driving the growth that allows yeah. me to have the share price go up? But it's, it's I guess what I, I mean, again, like the prediction on overall conflict levels, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I I'm just putting out there that the narrative that venture back capital, that Silicon Valley to the rescue is a more complicated yes. one than that bumper sticker. And let alone, we didn't even get into the fun part of your venture back capital underlying sources of it. I'm a basketball fan. The National Basketball Association has more rules regulating sovereign wealth fund ownership of NBA teams than we've really got transparency on right now in the defense economy. 